Hi, I'm Praneet Jaggi and in this lecture we're going to be talking about a famous essay of George Orwell, Politics and the English Language. Now, George Orwell is a well-known name. Ar Eric Arthur Blair, born in 1903, is actually well-known by his pen name George Orwell. He was an English novelist, essayist, journalist and critic. And he is very well known for the dystopian novel 1984 that was published way back in 1949 and also the satirical novella Animal Farm published in 1945 which is still taught in colleges and universities and these two books have together sold more copies than any two books by any other 20th century author. His popularity can be measured by the fact that in 2008 the Times magazine ranked George Orwell second among the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. And another surprising fact, uh, Orwell was born in India. In 1903, he was born in Bihar, Motihari Bihar in British India. And in addition to his literary career, he served as a police officer with the Indian Imperial Police in Burma from 1922 to 27 and also fought with the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. He was severely wounded when he was shot through his throat. Later, he joined other political organizations also. And then, uh, due to these political rivalries and accusations, he had to escape from France and then return to, sorry, from Spain and return to England. Uh, he is uh, known for his dystopian novel and... Uh, here we are going to be discussing his essay, Politics and the English Language. Now this essay, published in 1946, actually criticized and talked about the ugly and inaccurate written English of his time. And it also examines the connection between the political orthodoxies and the debasement of English language. It was published originally first in uh, April 1946 to issue of the journal Horizon and later in his own collection of poem, uh, essays. Sorry. Now what is this essay about? As the title indicates, it is about the politics of the English language. How did English language come to a level in which we call it debased, we call it mean, we call it malicious? So the, the thesis of this essay actually can be divided into two portions which coexist. In the introduction of the essay, uh, he asserts the notion that the English language has been disfigured by the human race and is on the residual decline as a resultant. Orwell attributes this downfall to politics and economic causes but goes on to outline his remedy to correct what he refers to as reversible process. Now, what he is trying to say is that the kind of English we have now has gone through utter debasement. It is not the kind of English that we want. It has been uh, kind of degenerated to a certain extent that we, we don't enjoy the freshness of the English language and most of it has occurred because of the economic and political reasons. But towards the end of the essay, he also gives remedies to correct what is going on in English language and says that it is a reversible process. <clears throat> now what he does is in the essay, he cites, he takes up passages from several prominent essays and articles and he concludes on the similarities uh, in the staleness of the imagery and the lack of precision used in these articles and essays. He criticizes these passages that he takes from different sources and he says that the vagueness, the lack of clarity and the incompetence of these articles, these political writings actually have disturbed the purity, the, uh, the, the kind of the refreshing quality of the English language, especially the prose construction. So in this course, the first point that he mentions in his essay is the dying metaphors. 
Now I will be quoting very selected lines from the essay because it is not possible to cover the entire text of the essay in this lecture. So the main point that he covers under dying metaphors is, he says a newly invented metaphor assists thought by evoking a visual image while on the other hand a metaphor which is technically dead, he gives the example of the metaphor iron resolution has in effect reverted to being an ordinary word and can generally be used without loss of vividness. But in between these two classes, there is a huge dump of worn out metaphors which have lost all evocative power and are merely used because they save people the trouble of inventing phrases for themselves. Examples are ring the changes on, take up the cudgel for, toe the line, etc. Now what he is doing here is he, is, he is explaining the difference between the newly invented and the dead metaphors. He says that there is a huge dump, a huge pile of metaphors that are worn out, that are commonly used but they don't have the power to arouse the imagination of the reader. And he argues here that many authors use these metaphors out of context without even knowing and they pervert the original meaning without the metaphor's creator having the knowledge of it. So he gives several examples in this context that these metaphors are dying. People don't even know how to use them, but they are still using them for the sake of using them. Then he says there are operators of verbal false limbs. Now in this uh, point or paragraph he says, these save the trouble of picking out appropriate verbs and nouns and at the same time pad each sentence with extra syllables which give it an appearance of symmetry. Characteristic phrases are render inoperative, militate against, make contact with, etc. 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 The keynote is the, the elimination of simple verbs. Instead of being a single word such as break, stop, spoil, a verb becomes a phrase made up of a noun or objective tagged on to some general purpose verb such as prove, serve, form, play, render. Now what is he trying to say here? He says that there are so many writers who use extraneous verbs and nouns, <coughs> the extra verbs and nouns to just overlap their sentence and create an illusion that look this is looking so symmetrical. When at a place, simple verbs can be used, simple conjunctions and prepositions can be used, the writers tend to use, they abuse the convenient word placements and they create a lavish phrase. For example, he says, characteristic phrases such as render inoperative. Now, render inoperative means actually stop. A machine has been rendered inoperative. He says a simple verb can be used such as stop. So this kind of a usage is actually made a habit with the writers who want to present themselves as lavish and extravagant holders of the English language. Then he comes to the point of pretentious diction. <clears throat> He says words like phenomenon, element, individual, objective, categorical, effective, virtual, basic, primary, promote, constitute, exhibit, exploit, utilize, eliminate, liquidate are used to dress up a simple statement and give an air of scientific impartiality to biased judgments. So what is pretentious? Pretentious means when you are pretending something, when you actually do not mean it, which, is, which lacks the genuineness, something which is fake, which gives the look of a fake thing. So diction pretentious means when something can be covered or expressed with simple meaningful words, but in the place of those simple words, we used jargons or we used superficial uh, words or diction. Now, this also uh, covers the use of extensive or, or elaborate uh, uh, foreign words like the poets who are into the habit of using the Latin phrases or the French phrases. So, he even uh, criticizes those. 
So next he says meaningless words. The writers also often tend to use meaningless words. Now why are these meaningless words needed? In certain kinds of writing, particularly in art criticism and literary criticism, it is normal to come across long passages which are almost completely lacking in meaning. Words like romantic, plastic, values, human, dead, sentimental, natural, vitality as used in art criticism are strictly meaningless in the sense that they not only do not point to any discoverable object but are hardly ever expected to do so by the reader. So now here in this passage, he makes the assertion that amongst the confusion of long literary and political critiques and especially art critiques, the, writer often, the writing often becomes meaningless as a result of the improper language or the jargons or the abstract words. Now the use of such meaningless words, he says, such as these values or romantic or natural, he says they do not make any sense. They do not have any concrete indication or any explicit meaning. Now towards the conclusion, uh, he is very clear about what should be and what should not be there while using English or what can be the steps in saving the language as a beautiful language and not uh, letting it degrade. So he offers, he suggests six rules. He says do not use metaphors that you are uh, used to reading in other texts. The use of an effective shorter word is better than longer inappropriate words. If you can remove an extraneous word from a sentence, extraneous means extra, without which you can do, without which you can convey the meaning completely. So if you can remove an extraneous word from a sentence, do so accordingly. Abstain from the use of the passive tense when the active tense is available. Abstain means avoid. You should avoid the use of the passive tense when you have the privilege or you have the opportunity or the sense is complete in active tense. Refrain from the use of scientific jargon and foreign words if you can find the colloquial equivalent. Refrain means again control yourself. Avoid the use of scientific jargon, technical words, which uh, may not be understood by the ordinary, the, the normal readers, or even the foreign words, for which you have to provide notes or you have to provide explanations, which any layman may not get. So if you have the colloquial equivalent, if you have the equivalent words, which are used in the colloquial day-to-day -day normal language of the conversation, it is better that you use those colloquial usages rather than the jargons, the scientific and technical words and the foreign language words. Break these rules rather than saying anything completely monstrous. So he says, break all the rules rather than going uh, huge, massive and showy and pretentious like a monster. So overall, what he's trying to conclude with is the word simple. Be simple, be meaningful, be short. So this is how Orwell has contributed in maintaining the standards, the beauty of the English language through this essay, Politics and the English Language. Thank you for now.